Yes, I remember you. So you met you at Birmingham. That's right. You are, we, 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 we send you a, a complimentary copy of the tape. Do you really? That's exciting. I'll see you during the interview. Great. I'll sit down a minute and stand yes, up when you've uh, done your bit. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to see you here this evening. We've had a pretty unfortunate beginning to 1982 in terms of our lectures, as some of you will appreciate. The first one, you may remember, was the weather was so bad that we had to cancel it, the speaker couldn't reach us. Then the second one last month, with the, strain, the train uh, strike, our guest speaker couldn't travel all the way from Birmingham. And uh, you will remember Robin Lindsay stepped in and did a noble job for us. So it is with some great pleasure that I heave a sigh of relief and uh, introduce to you tonight uh, Kevin McClure, uh, who has travelled uh, down from the Midlands to us. Um, Norman Oliver, as you will know from your programme card, was due to chair this session, but uh, the bag is still at work somewhere because we had a telephone call about uh, half an hour ago saying that his car had broken down. So uh, we're really uh, under pressure from somewhere. Now, I know that you're going to have a very interesting uh, talk tonight from Kevin McClure, who amongst uh, other things uh, is the editor of Common Ground. Uh, this is a, a journal which uh, um, is paraphrased its style as studies at the fringe of human experience. And uh, there are copies, I understand, uh, on the table outside that can be purchased uh, of Kevin's work. He is by profession a uh, social security um, fraud investigator. <laughs> <laughs> so don't try and get a copy for nothing. Uh, as an interesting aside, Kevin, of course, uh, was studying theology at Oxford. But uh, during the course of his studies, uh, he decided not to go through with uh, entry into the church in the formal way and of course he has had a, done a lot of work in the field and in areas of the paranormal and psychical research and if you read his common ground journal which I was telling I read a copy on holiday and was able to relax and enjoy it and I think you're in for a very a good presentation this evening so ladies and gentlemen without more ado I introduce you to Kevin McClure thank you very much I think I'm here under slightly false pretenses. Um, last week, our local RIC, Mark Brown in Leicestershire, rang me up and said, uh, would I like to become an accredited investigator because it was cheap for my next year's subscription? And I said, yes, that would be fine. And he said, when does it fall due? And I thought, and I realised I haven't got one this year at all. I haven't paid. So I hope you don't mind me being here, and I'll arrange something afterwards, I promise. Uh, I fixed the title for this talk about six months ago. It was uh, left open to me. And um, I thought rather cleverly at the time, chose something sufficiently vague to talk about anything. But actually, when I sat down and tried to write something called Religious Responses to UFO Experience, um, set me all sorts of problems, like defining religious, <coughs> defining religious responses, UFOs, experience, the lot. So I've endeavoured to start the talk by putting together what I mean by the title, and uh, then I proceed from there. I understand that Bob Morell was meant to be with you last month. Um, <clears throat> I thought you would notice a contrast in attitudes to what UFOs really are. Unless he's changed his outlook considerably since I last saw him, his is one of the least elastic definitions of the term UFO. For Bob to earn the title of UFO, an object has not only to remain unidentified after exhaustive investigation, but also to have been actually in flight, in aerial motion, at some stage during the sighting. None of this sitting on the ground nonsense for Bob Morell. Now, I wouldn't completely agree with such a strict definition, but I certainly wouldn't be happy always to apply the sort of use of the term UFO experience that I intend to employ, employ this evening. But just this once, we are not dealing with facts or even with scientific investigation, but with a much more complex situation where emotion, desire, need and conditioning play at least as important a part as the claimed UFO experience itself in determining an individual's responses. 
No, on this occasion, the UFO experience is whatever the witness who claims to have had it believes it to be. Furthermore, it is also whatever the non-witness believes it to be, the non-witness being anyone who reads a report in a magazine or a book or hears of it from a friend. Establishing facts is not important in this context. Belief is the thing. The way in which the individual interprets whatever experience or revelation he or she feels they have been party to. UFO can almost imply any outdoor anomalous experience, not merely of a figure. Defining the term religious response certainly presents problems. Most belief systems are extensions, extrapolations, of a number of apparent facts, experiences and items of information. If you consider the historical roots of any religion in which you have been involved in the past or are involved in now, I think you will see there is some truth in that. The extensions of the original basics are seldom, if ever, based upon logic, reason or proof, but are usually in large part a matter of trust or faith, a belief that there is more to existence than birth, death and an up and down life in between, a hope that out there, beyond the earth and its difficulties, is someone, somewhere, who cares, someone who is interested in what happens to us, who will notice and act accordingly if we are particularly good or particularly bad who may even intervene if the situation on this planet becomes unbearable for us and our kind, who may perhaps take care of some surviving element of us after our physical death. Without wishing to be at all offensive, and I came close to entering the church myself, I think it is fairly clear that there are some parallels between traditional forms of religious belief, particularly Christian ones with their concepts of intervention, resurrection and salvation, and many of the beliefs in the source and significance of UFO events and experiences that we, and others hold and have held. Bearing this in mind, I hope it is not too excessive to define a religious response as the assumption that an anomalous event or experience that occurs to an ordinary human being on this earth provides us with some extraordinary information. This information is not only about the physical nature of extraterrestrial existence, but that there is also some interplay between ourselves and forces or intelligences beyond the earth physically or in some other dimension of time or space. In other words, someone who responds in a religious way to a UFO or other anomalous or unidentified experience is doing so because they believe there is some interplay, some interreaction between the intelligent beings that occupy this world and intelligent beings that do not. Such a belief implies that each will have an effect upon the other. If that is the case, then it is not surprising that understanding the fact can affect people's behaviour and lifestyle leading them either to life in a monastery or to travelling the world to publicise the coming of the Space Brothers. Having established what I hope are workable definitions, I would like to look at three particular areas in which UFO and related experiences appear to have led to responses we could regard as religious. 1. Where the UFO experience, as it has occurred over, probably, thousands of years, has been incorporated into traditional and long-established forms of religious belief such that the original experiences have become almost unrecognisable in the surviving accounts. Two, where either a direct UFO experience or knowledge of the experiences of others has taken on a central role in an otherwise fairly typical belief system or religion. The UFO itself or its occupants or creators in some way re replaced the traditional figure of God or of his angels or messengers. And three, individual interpretations of UFO experience as signifying a particular threat or promise, or advantage, or danger to that individual or to the mass in a way that is pseudo-religious, like a religious response, but outside a rigid belief system or cult. Much of the history of recorded UFO experience prior to 1947 is lost in the depths of traditional religion, though there is certainly evidence that the nature and subject matter of visions has changed over the years, just from the airships of the turn of this century to the transient abducting spacecraft of the 1970s there is nothing to suggest that visions have not always occurred. There are, of course, plenty of books and articles about the possible significance of incidents in the Bible, such as Ezekiel's Wheel, the Star of Bethlehem and the Ascension, and in other religions too. The Upanishads, <coughs> with their tales of Hindu deities, seem to be very much the favourite. Unfortunately, the scriptures of most faiths have been rewritten so many times that they are far from dependable. Often, the stories and incidents that they include were passed on orally, by word of mouth only, for hundreds of years before they were first put down in writing. And though it is interesting to wonder whether such and such a passage of scripture actually refers to a UFO sighting, we are never really going to know one way or the other. More dependable and more informative about the way in which the religious response to UFO experience develops in the modern world 
are the numerous reports of visions that have occurred in the last couple of centuries. Fatima, Portugal, as you all know, is a classic case, though usually it is the incidents of the 13th of October 1917, the final events of the sequence that are reported, the so-called Dance of the Sun. Of more interest to us today is the following, taken from a pamphlet published by the Catholic Truth Society. In 1932, the Vicar General of the Diocese Leria recalled to a fellow priest how they had seen a globe of light float slowly down from the east and disappear. After a while, it returned. Another description of the same day runs, on September the 13th, 1917, that's a month before the Dance of the Sun, an estimated crowd of 40,000 gathered in front of the Evergreen Oak. This is where the Virgin Mary was said to appear. This time, a globe of light appeared on the tree, followed by the white cloud and the rain, which began to fall down from a clear sky. Witnesses described it as a luminous globe coming from the east and moving to the west, gliding slowly and majestically through space. It is worth stressing that at no time in the sequence of visions at Fatima was the figure of the Virgin Mary seen by any dependable adult, but only by the group of child witnesses. Light phenomena of the kind reported by the Vicar General of Leria were seen on several occasions while the children claimed to be seeing the Virgin, yet on their own, without that unseen humanoid presence, they were simply UFO phenomena. Their link with the figure of the Mother of Christ was assumed, was believed in, but it was never established by the evidence. I wonder if the light phenomena would have occurred without the crowds and without the preceding visions. I also wonder if travelling lights are the most basic, most common form of anomalous phenomenon, in some way perhaps that which is most easily caused to appear, whoever or whatever may cause them to do so. Some of you already have come across our research into the UFO and other paranormal phenomena that were reported by a great many sane, intelligent people in North Wales during the 1904-1905 Welsh Religious Revival. Here in a booklet which by sheer coincidence Lionel Beer has purchased some copies from, of from me and uh, has on sale in the interval, I believe. <clears throat> Over a period of five or six months, aerial lights were seen on numerous occasions, usually in connection with one particular female evangelist, Mary Jones. <coughs> These lights, or balls of fire as they were often described, undertook the most complex manoeuvres of travelling, turning, rising, falling, disintegrating and reforming, disappearing and reappearing miles away, hovering over the homes of those who were next to be converted, and over chapels where Mary Jones was soon to preach. They were even said to appear inside chapels during services. To an outside observer, and remember there would have been an absolute minimum of aerial traffic over the Cambrian coast on a winter's night in 1904, the phenomena that occurred there would have been quite simply unidentified and flying objects. That they occurred simultaneously with a widespread outburst pardon me, of religious fervour is undoubtedly significant, but at no time did contemporary observers think to treat the light phenomena as separate from the religious revival itself. If the reports of this period are even 50% true, and I'm confident that they are, then they constitute the most notable series of UFO and paranormal events that have ever occurred in this country. Yet because the response to them was entirely a religious one, interpreting them as implying the active involvement of an almighty God in the work of evangelising and converting the people of North Wales, they have been almost ignored until the last few years and have never been objectively reported to any satisfactory standard. What could have been an invaluable group of reports has been lost to the bottomless pit of religious interpretation. Nor has this interdependence of UFO experience and religious belief ceased since the advert of modern, advent of modern worldwide ufology. In his forthcoming book, Miracles, a Parascientific Inquiry into Wondrous Phenomena, the American parapsychologist D. Scott Rogo reports that a more specific Fatima-like miracle recently occurred in the Dominican Republic. On March 29, 1972, a public mass attended by more than a thousand people was held in the courtyard of Arroyo Hondo College. During the ceremony, a dark cloud appeared and opened in the sky, revealing a glowing disc that illuminated the entire courtyard. The cloud then folded up and the object vanished. So much for the UFO experience as it has been incorporated into traditional forms of religion. All that I would add to this aspect is that I have been careful to deal with the least controversial cases, specifically those involving close-range lights in the sky and a possible CE1, to start on the matter of whether named personalities from scripture were actually UFO occupants is altogether too wild and expansive a subject to tackle tonight. Anyway, it tends to be merely pointless speculation, even if it does sell books. No, it is in the second area of experience that I mention that we come to claims of CE2s and CE3s, 
and even more exotic forms of relation between mankind and non- or extraterrestrials. This area I have defined as where the UFO experience, whether direct or reported, takes on a central role in an otherwise fairly typical belief system, the UFO itself or its occupants or creators in some way replacing the traditional figure of God or of his angels or messengers. There have been a great number of such pseudo-religious UFO cults over the past 35 years, most of them in the United States. Many of you will have heard or read of, some of them, even encountered their believers and evangelists. However, there is little doubt that the best known and probably the longest lived of such groups started right here in London, still has public premises in Fulham and regular activities in different parts of this country. This group is, of course, the Aetherius Society, founded in the mid-1950s and apparently devoted to active cooperation between terrestrials and extraterrestrials for the betterment and salvation of mankind. Most of us must, at some time or another, have come across Aetherius Society members and found them to be wholesome and well-intentioned people. For those who are not acquainted with the mission of the Society or have not seen recent issues of their journal Cosmic Voice, I'd like to quote from a 13-page issue, numbered Volume 2, Issues number 10, 11 and 12, August to September 1981. <coughs> the cover story is headed Prayer Power to Poland, and what follows is part of an account of an Operation Prayer Power mission that started on St George's Day, April the 23rd, 1981, under the personal control of George King, the founder of the Aetherius Society. For many months, loyal members and supporters of the Aetherius Society in Detroit and Los Angeles had been charging spiritual energy batteries with their prayers and mantra, knowing that their action was desperately needed in case of an emergency situation such as this, or an earthquake, or a flood, or a hurricane. With his trained staff of spiritual energy radiator initiates in place in Los Angeles, His Eminence, Sir George King, set up one of the Operation Prayer Power batteries ready for discharge to the crisis area to provide the desperately needed spiritual support for the beleaguered Poles. He also had on call cosmic forces comprising the six adepts and the Great White Brotherhood, <coughs> whose cooperation is an essential part of any Operation Prayer Power discharge manipulation at this time. On the night of April the 23rd, 1981, St George's Day, appropriately, the discharge of Operation Prayer Power to Poland began at 9.12pm. It started in a dramatic and unexpected manner. The cosmic forces with whom his eminence was in communication were in place. The target area for the energies had been picked and all agencies were ready to go. Phase 1 started, but there was a hitch. The prayer energies were not being picked up by Adept 002 and 003 in position in their invisible spacecraft above the central base of operations in Los Angeles. The energy in the battery, which had come from Detroit, was not powerful enough to use. After stopping the dis discharge and testing it once more, His Eminence made the decision to substitute a battery charge in Los Angeles and went ahead once again with the release after a one-minute test confirmed that this time the energy was being picked up. <coughs> As the action restarted, it did so in more, more ways than one. While a 15-minute energy discharge was being released to add up 002 and 003, prior to their physically carrying these energies to the target area, no less than three phases were being carried out simultaneously with phase two by Great White Brotherhood retreats, who joined in this massive blanketing of spiritual energies to the threatened area. This proved once again how masterly a piece of karmic strategy Operation Prayer Power really is, as it permits this kind of direct intervention from higher forces on Earth to take place on a much greater, rate, greater ratio than the actual amount of effort expended to charge the Operation Prayer Power batteries. In fact, His Eminence received reports as he communicated telepathically with his agents, which showed that the Great White Brotherhood retreat in Kilimanjaro, East Africa, from where I believe that uh, Anne Harcourt's just returned, he didn't beat them, had now joined in the release pattern, with the discharge being manipulated by the adepts, including the Lord Babaji, to form a kind of spiritual frontier around Poland and right up along its borders with Russia. Meanwhile, Adept 002 and 003 requested a further discharge of 15 minutes of prayer energy from Battery A1, which was now being discharged in Los Angeles, and this was duly performed, meaning that a total of 363 prayer hours of spiritual energy had now been discharged from the Los Angeles battery. While certain classified moves were taking place in the target zone under the direction of the Adepts, Phase 2A was completed and Phase 2B went into effect as 002 and 003 moved like lightning into position over the area. As the operation progressed, it became evidence to, evident to his eminence that the basic spiritual energies which had been put into the Operation Prayer Power batteries by ordinary men and women were turning out to be very successful in the complex manipulations taking place to provide a spiritual buttress against com communist expansionism. In fact, he was able, by using his unique powers of communication once again, to learn from no lesser source than the cosmic master, Mars Sector 6, that there was a heavy, re 
please. That there was a heavy resonance of spiritual energies over the whole of Poland, with the area totally saturated and unable to absorb all the power immediately. Nonetheless, this was exactly the desired effect, for it gave those in the area who were working for peace and humanity the ammunition they so sorely needed to combat the forces actively seeking to dominate their country. Upon reporting that he had learned that the Great White Brotherhood had discharged 262 prayer hours of blanketing energies to the area, as well as 972 hours of A-plus energies, which they totaled 1,046 hours of A-plus and A in all, His Eminence was able to close down the highly successful operation and wait for the inevitable results to come, and come they did. As it is now obvious to all who study international affairs, the Russians decided against an invasion of Poland. <coughs> I think I deserve a drink after that. It's better. <coughs> As I have said, there are many examples one could take of youthful cults and religions, but the Ethereum Society is both British and absolutely typical. It was founded by one charismatic individual who claimed to be uniquely capable of communication with non-terrestrials. These non-terrestrials, who are, of course, considerably superior in every way to humankind, had entrusted a mission to the communicator and any who would follow him. Missions in such circumstances vary considerably. Alan Michael Noonan believes that with the help of the aliens, many of whom live on the planet Venus, his cult, known as the One World Family, will first eliminate all professing Christians and then take over the government of the USA and the running of the United Nations. The Institute of Cosmic Research, founded by a young man known as Gordon in Michigan in 1967, encouraged his followers to build a small flying saucer called Bluebird. He had been told by beings from Io, one of the moons of Jupiter, to build the saucer and fly it into the skies. At this point it would be joined by saucers from other planets. Together they would circle Earth for three days, darkening the sky. People would look up and wonder why, then fall on their knees and start practicing universal law. Still other groups have encouraged their members and believers to devote themselves to intricate preparations for the end of the world, on the assumption that if they are ready, they will be taken off by UFOs just before the event. <coughs> Compared to such activities, those practiced by the Ethereum Society, to give its believers a sense of purpose and achievement, seem relatively worthwhile, but all are distinguished by one quality, that they are based on belief, not reason, on belief in an individual who is able to communicate with intelligences for the existence of whom there is no objective evidence whatever and belief in a construction of the universe for which established knowledge offers absolutely no support. In some cases, such as that of the Ethereum Society, the belief group has not been formed as a direct result of an individual UFO experience, but all the prominent features and ideas of 1950s contactee ufology are present in its principles and tenets. So why am I concerned enough about the nature of religious response to UFO experience to take up an evening of your time with the subject? Is there any more to this than an academic interest in historical reports and contactee cults? I think that there is. While the UFO cults and religions may bring a certain amount of ridicule on our subject and undermine our efforts to have it taken seriously, and while the relegation of a high proportion of historical sighting reports to the status of religious myths is a considerable loss to our records, neither really impinge upon the standing or development of intelligent modern ufology. But the same cannot be said of the real danger area the third area of, res of response I described earlier, where individuals interpret the UFO experience of themselves or others as signifying a particular threat or promise or advantage or danger to the individual or to the mass. These are responses that are religious in the assumptions that they make about the nature of existence and the nature of the physical universe. Assumptions in particular about the extent and future of the free will of humanity. Maintaining a sense of calm objectivity is difficult at the best of times, and for anyone committed to and involved in the fields of UFO or paranormal research, it is clearly far more so. Most of us who belong to UFO groups will know that there are other group members with extreme views about the source of craft or the intention of their occupants or whatever. Some such purveyors of extreme and essentially unreasonable views have gone much further. One sits in the House of Lords. Another has made a major industry of a small Wiltshire town and its reported UFO sightings. Another, who claimed to be the editor of an important UFO journal, wrote the most absurd of the books about the Diffid Enigma. Another has contrived to link the theosophical works of Madame Blavatsky with the concepts of benevolent aliens, taking the alternative three book and TV programs seriously along the way. These are just British examples alone. American examples are far more numerous. Unfortunately, though in a group such personalities can be tamed and made harmless to a great extent, it is much less easy to control figures that can obtain media coverage for themselves and for our subject or who can find publishers for the oddest of UFO books, 
Sadly, it seems to be much easier to have UFO material published if it is about travellers from distant planets under attack or UFOs popping out of holes in the poles of this Earth. How a respected publisher can put out a book that concludes with an exhortation to give Lapland to the extraterrestrials, I cannot imagine, particularly when the sane and intelligent <coughs> investigation guides by Jenny Randalls are not considered sufficiently saleable to appear in paperback. Yet even such publications as these are not exactly hard to detect for what they are. Not so easy for the general public, maybe, but not too difficult for anyone with some experience. We can tell that they are written in response to one of two motivations, money or a genuine belief, a faith, in a concept that is not supported by known evidence or facts. The relig religious response, in other words, however it may be disguised. What is a real problem is the apparent inevitability that even the very best and most respected of authors in the UFO field will, eventually, be tempted towards belief in one or another illogical, unreasonable idea which, because it is going to sell books, is going to be quickly picked up by a publisher. Of course, it is immensely difficult to resist making a commitment of some kind, suspending your objectivity entirely, and saying what you feel, or what you suspect, or what you hope may be true. Few established authors have succeeded consistently in resisting this temptation after their first two or three books. Brad Steiger, in particular, whose Gods of Aquarius was taken seriously, even, I seem to remember, by the Magonia team, is an example of one author who has gone completely over the top in recent years, as anyone who's, who has read Encounters of the Angelic Kind will know. Another individual who is taking an increasingly subjective view of the significance of UFO experience is Leo Sprinkle. A similar force seems to be at work among the FSR editorial team. We cannot say, <coughs> with evidence to support our opinion, that these people are categorically wrong, let alone that they are intentionally pushing a false case. What we can say is that there is no objective or established evidence to support their speculations. Without the need to believe, they would probably come to very different conclusions. Excuse me. <coughs> In the second issue of Common Ground, which is now the Journal of Record for ASAP, I took a long look at what has become known as the UFO control system theory. This is, very briefly, the theory that not only is the nature and content of UFO experience intelligently controlled by external forces, and this often includes the possibility that most sightings are of projected non-physical illusions, but that the UFO experience is being controlled for a purpose, and that that purpose is to modify or adapt human behaviour. Four authors, all highly respected and published on a number of occasions, were particularly taken to task. These were Jacques Vallée, Jerome Clark, D. Scott Rogo and John Keel. Let me quote from each of them, and just a little from the article. First of all, from Jerome Clark and Scott Rogo's Earth Secret Inhabitants. Let's begin by supposing that somewhere in the universe there is an intelligence or force, we'll call it the phenomenon, for want of a better word, that's beaming projections of various kinds into our world. Whatever its nature, it has some deep sense of what human beings are thinking, and it provides us with visions that reflect the concerns of the human mind. <coughs> From Jacques Vallée's Invisible College. They are the means through which man's concepts are being arranged. All we can do is to trace their effects on humans. I suggest that it is human belief that is being controlled and conditioned. From Vallée's Messengers of Deception. I believe there is a machinery of mass manipulation behind the UFO phenomenon. UFO contactees are the tools of a global plan. These silent agents are walking among us unseen, placing social time bomb bombs at strategic spiritual locations. Further, from Scott Rocco's UFO abductions, which I believe sold very well in this country. The phenomenon is probably a storehouse of psychic power. A psychic person may be naturally attuned to this intelligence. Similarly, contact with it may endow the witness with psychic power. The UFO phenomenon is guiding us, and we should seek to understand the message behind the communications UFO abductees deliver to us. They might be vital for our psychological and social survival. And from John Keel's Eighth Tower, <coughs> the human race has always been aware that it was serving as a pawn in some cosmic game. We have been programmed well, but the Eighth Tower is dying of old age. The manifestations around us are not the work of the gods, but of a senile machine playing out the end game. It's also perhaps worth quoting Alan Hynek, who I gather isn't coming next week. There are people who've had UFO experiences who claim to have developed psychic ability. There have been reported cases of healings in close encounters, and there have been reported cases of precondition, where people had foreknowledge or forewarning that they were going to see something. There has been a change of outlook, a change of philosophy of persons' lives. Now, you see, these are rather tricky things to talk about, but it's there. Many people, like Jack Vallée and I, to some extent, feel that it might be a conditioning process. 
Keywords and phrases, even from these short passages, become quickly apparent. Mass manipulation, arranged, controlled and conditioned, provides us with visions. The UFO phenomenon is guiding us. We have been programmed well. It might be a conditioning process. They are words and phrases that seem to imply consistency, deliberation and design in the phenomena to which they refer. They seek to establish intention and planning, consistency, concern and guidance as qualities implicit in UFO experience and in UFO reports. In a research field where the very complexity of our classification systems has resulted from the extreme variability of the phenomena, and where the strongest argument against any kind of extraterrestrial hypothesis is the very quantity and variety of craft that have been reported, it is strange to find important writers thinking in these terms. Considering that the arguments are based on material drawn from fields as diverse as folklore, psychical research, mystical experience, visions of the Virgin Mary, UFOs, out-of-body experiences, altered states of consciousness and Fortiana, the drawing of such conclusions is even more surprising. To quote again from Kill's Eighth Tower, a little greater length, Many used to believe that earthly events, wars and disasters were merely duplications of events taking place in an alternative universe populated by gods. But now it seems more likely that we are actually component parts of some larger system and that we are manipulated to serve the needs of that system. We may never be able to clearly understand these needs, let alone understand the system itself. It retained its control over the slaves and is still functioning today. Instead of being a shapeless energy field in the sky, the Eighth Tower could be a specific device in a specific location on this planet. It has endured because it has the basic instinct for self-preservation and is able to conceal itself from us by laying out false trails, by populating our forests with hairy red-eyed monsters and our skies with luminous objects. And finally from, Keel's, from Valet's very peculiar messengers of deception. Let me summarise my conclusions thus far. UFOs are real. They are an application of psychotronic technology that is, they are physical devices used to affect human consciousness. They may not be from outer space. They may, in fact, be terrestrial-based manipulating devices. Their methods are those of, this, of deception, systematic manipulation of witnesses and contactees, covert use of various sects and cults, control of the channels through which the alleged space messages can make an impact on the public. You will see human beings under the control of a strange force that is bending them in absurd ways forcing them to play a role in the bizarre game of deception. This role may be very important if changing social conditions make it desirable to focus the attention of the public on the distant stars, while obsolete human institutions are wiped out and rebuilt in new ways. Is this the deeper meaning of the UFO deception? Are the manipulators, in the final analysis, nothing more than a group of humans who have mastered a very advanced form of power? Consider this. UFO contactees are the glo tools of a, so of a global plan, these silent agents are walking among us unseen, placing social time bombs at strategic spiritual locations. Some fine morning, we may wake up from our scientific complacency to find strangers walking through the ruins of our establishments. This is not UFO investigation, and it is not based upon logic, reason or evidence. It is belief and speculation masquerading as intelligent perception. It is misleading to ufologists and casual readers alike. It typifies the worst and most damaging aspects of the religious response to UFO experience. In authors of this calibre, it is both disturbing and undesirable. Happily, and not only because I am as big a sucker as anybody for receiving letters from famous people, I have received responses to this article from two of the authors I criticised, which I found very encouraging, hoping that I might, in due course, receive something similarly candid from Jack Vallée, who was, for me at one time, much the most perceptive writer in the whole UFO field. I would like to end by quoting from these letters, which are from John Keel and Jerome Clark who is now associate, edit associate editor of the influential Mass Circulation Fate magazine. I think Jerry Clark's humility is something we should all bear in mind when any, any of us become tempted to confuse the few available facts in ufology with our own wishful thinking. First of all from John Keel, letter dated November the 11th, 1981. Thanks very much for putting me on the mailing list for Common Ground. I enjoyed number two, and I wish we had comparable journals here in the USA. Unfortunately, the American publica publications have long been mired in the UFO mythos and dwell endlessly on the manufactured controversies of shriveled minds. Oh, that's a good line, doesn't it, Keel? <coughs> <coughs> Gets better. The current lull has reduced the UFO field to a handful of die-hard crackpot types who snipe at each other in what might be called a battle of wits, if only they had any wits. So American ufology is a kind of Lauren and Hardy pie-throwing contest, completely lacking serious intent or rational content. <coughs> There can only be one real question in ufology. All others are superfluous, 
superfluous, frivolous and unnecessary. We must ask why specific people in specific geographical locations, within a specific time frame, undergo specific alterations of consciousness while experiencing stimulation of their perceptive processes from an unknown source. All of the world's religions have tried to deal with this question for thousands of years. When science becomes a religion, or acquires religious-like characteristics, it is scientism. American ufologists have been practicing scientism, not science. I've never pretended to be a scientist, and I have always clearly identified my methodology as journalistic rather than scientific. The scientist counts the angels dancing on the pinhead. The journalist studies the pin. I wish you luck with Common Ground, and hope you can continue to stimulate thought without falling prey to the little green man syndrome. And from Jerry Clark, a uh, very recent letter dated February the 23rd this year. <coughs> semaphore without flags is the article of mine in Common Ground. I was interested, of course, in your Semaphore without flags essay, which I'll be discussing in the Fate book column. In your letter you seem a little defensive about my response. I thought he wouldn't review it, to be honest, because it's so critical of him. You may be surprised to learn that my only objection is that you are not critical enough of new, new ufological moonshine, including my own. I think the time is long past for us to be engaging in speculations, far removed from the evidence, whether we are claiming UFOs as positively identified extraterrestrial craft or as exotic pseudo-psychological phenomena. I'm practicing that. I find myself as impatient with the Magonia approach as I am with the Stan Friedman approach. I meant it when I said in, in Encyclopedia of UFOs that I am an agnostic on the UFO question. Something is there, certainly, but as you put it in your article, that something is as mysterious now as it ever was, and we may as well face up to that. You display some understandable confusion about my position, noting the conflict between the Encyclopedia of UFO statement and the speculations in Earth's secret inhabitants. I should explain that inhabitants was strictly a take-the-money-and-run product, and I assumed, foolish, foolishly it appears, that nobody but a few American teenagers would ever see it. <coughs> the publisher demanded some kind of explanation for the various phenomena the book deals with, so I came up with some off-the-cuff ideas of the sort, usually generated in the course of casual discussion over a couple of beers. I certainly didn't mean for anybody to take it seriously. I don't. It was offered not as a serious theory, but just as one of many highly speculative ways of looking at a wide range of phenomena. If I have any firm beliefs about the nature of UFO phenomenon, they can be summed up as I summed them to Al Hendry, who's staying at my house on a brief visit last night. I wish I could say things like that. <laughs> they probably are something that nobody's ever thought of. Anyway, my current position or my past position is that, as I wrote in Trutz's Utesic Scholar, The Unidentified was a dumb book. That goes for all my books, by the way. Maybe next time, if I can ever bring myself to write another book on UFOs, I'll get it right. But I haven't so far. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that... Uh, there are certain things in your mind that you would like to ask Kevin, so uh, perhaps I can have the first question, and he's very happy to field all your uh, balls that you throw. No one's got a rip from the Ethereum Society, have they? <laughs> <laughs> I checked, and there's nothing about reading it out in public in the copyright. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I'll stand up to answer your questions. I'll slightly stiff back from being around all day. Um, I think it's very hard to separate out out-of-body experience from um, simple effects that happen to people when they're falling asleep, when they're waking up, when they're drugged or drowsy. There are classical forms of out-of-body experience. Um, I witnessed one drug-induced out-of-body experience on one occasion, which seemed to take a particularly classic form where the... Uh, astral body or a, a figurative body slipped out of the main, the physical body of the person and the person described to me their travels first of all over and above the Oxford College where we were um, <coughs> in a room with these drugs, um, not close to them, and uh, went off to explore the universe and ended up in a kind of vast dish-like effect in which was hidden the secret of the universe in the middle but which the person couldn't get over the side um, but they observed Oxford from above, it was sort of both physical and metaphysical experience. And I think that was, that was pretty much an archetypal out-of-body experience, though obviously there have been much simpler forms reported. I mean, anyone who's, who's encountered Robert Munro's uh, books, journey, book journey out, Journeys Out of the Body uh, will find that he experimented in a, at least a pseudo-scientific way with, with techniques where he would uh, be lying down and would effectively roll his astral body out 
and then go to one of two or three locations where things appear to happen in some relation with what happened on Earth, but not of it, not in the same time span, but there appeared to be some um, inter-effect between the two. I think really out-of-body experience is an old word. <coughs> um, well, it's, it's, it's a newish expression for what used to be called astral projection, which um, I think was an expression coined in 1860, 1870 or so, and probably which before the idea of certain kinds of UFO experience covered a lot of what we would now call UFO experience. Um, there are so many similarities between typical UFO abduction cases where somebody is stopped in a car and transferred to a UFO standing in a field three, four hundred yards away uh, and inspected and explore new parts of the world, um, see things on screens and so on, and traditional forms of, of astral projection. But the, I, I think the two experiences are the same but culturally changed due to, to current states of knowledge. It's true of a lot of, of things, I think, that since 1947, since we have the idea of flying saucers, of UFOs, a lot of experiences that used to happen have just now got new interpretations on them. Um, it's, it's, it's something I haven't ever really experienced, um, not for want of trying. Um, is there um, a astral body seen by other people? If so, is it the cause of causing? Uh, now, the, obviously, experiments have been tried. Um, none of the formal experiments, so far as I know, have produced any visual effect. However, there, have, there are a number of spontaneous cases where there is certainly, it's, it's down to the old UFO thing, either you believe what people say or you don't, but there are a lot of reports where people have said, oh yes, I knew so-and-so was going to astrally project, or I saw you in my room, were you astrally projecting at the time? Oh yes, they say. And there's no saying either way. There is a, a very, very minute amount of evidence from the States that um, there has been some sort of sight of objects outside the room where the person is lying. But I think there's still doubt surrounding those experiments. Um, there are just literally one or two where there is some possibility that a person has been able to find out what is written on a card on a shelf in another room in a lab complex. But of course there are a lot of alternative explanations for that phenomena. And astral projection needn't necessarily be one of them. Most of the current theorists, theorists, I believe, are thinking in terms of it being a mental experience, um, whereby a mix of a dream or hypnagogic state, you know, you feel when you're going to sleep that you're drifting, you can, you can feel yourself drifting away from consciousness quite often if, if you're still lying in a chair and so that lovely warm feeling comes over and you sort of relax and, and slip away. A mix of that and possibly of telepathy could produce similar effects to the very little evidence that stands for out-of-body experience in any formal way. Um, so no, I don't think it, it's, it's responsible for haunting. Though you have got the question of crisis apparitions, where someone will be drowning in a boat in the middle of the Atlantic and their wife will see them, or daughter will see them, or father or mother will see them, um, in some dreadful state and sort of saying goodbye mummy or daddy or whatever, and they will see the figure of the person. Now I think then you must presume that if there is anything to it, it is again a form of telepathy, where the person seeing the person having the telepathic experience, receiving the message, close that message up in a physical form to make it more viable. Um, I don't think there is any real evidence of spontaneous events where somebody is actually projecting one side of the world and they turn up uh, somewhere else. Uh, well, please just Harry. Harry Evans. Of course, not being a member, they don't deliver it to me. <laughs> he says that uh, we should forget about interpretation, speculation, theory making, and stick to observation and facts. I can't believe that you really hold this But uh, you do rather go for forming what I think most of us would think to be the most, I wouldn't say profound, but the most exciting, the most tenuous. So would I. Because I know that they all are lovely with ideas. I don't necessarily agree with those ideas, but I would be very excited to form this to me. Uh, I'm not a scientist. So here you have people who are producing ideas. All right, so uh, Parker writes a marvelous letter which he wrote in which he points out that it's not a big too serious. I think we should you know, praise him, if you like, for producing ideas. 
Yes, <coughs> I wouldn't disagree at all. I, I think, um, I mean, firstly, I'm talking about religious or pseudo-religious responses, and I think that we are all guilty of them, or we would all like to have them at times. Um, I've found that since I gave up believing in a specific form of Christianity, um, if I get in a difficult situation or a dangerous situation, like in the course of my work, if somebody's about to beat me about the head with a hammer or something, um, I, f I feel guilty if I start praying um, because, of course, I have put away such things. And I think there is a responsibility upon serious, responsible UFO writers um, and considerers of masses of available evidence, far more than is likely to hit you or I, because these are the people who are in the States who are picking up the absolute plum cases, um, such as they are these days, who are getting the first go at, and, and first hand goes at, at, at absolutely first rate material. I think it is for them to resist the temptation to go over the top in their explanations um, because they will end up, people who read them will then end up like me ten years ago reading Operation Trojan Horse for the same time, for, for the first time going around telling everybody about how there's a parallel, uni parallel universe and there's UFOs slipping in and out of it which I was quite happy with for three or four years until someone else came up with something else, well in fact until the unidentified came along when I started thinking about the first and second laws of para-ufology and um, you know, I consider myself to be tolerably intelligent and I've, I've certainly been thoroughly um, misled by all this wonderful stuff and when it comes to it there isn't really all that much to support it and I, I just think that we've all got a responsibility those of, who are, those of us who are paid for writing books about UFOs far more than those of us who um, just go out on the old skywatch or just read a book to be responsible and, and to act responsibly and to put in conditions as to our speculation if these books just had in them this is pure speculation uh, then fine. It's, it's like the, the problem, I, mean, I don't know how many of you have seen Jenny Randall's new book, um, Alien Contact. Um, it's, she dwelt in the first issue of Common Ground on her problems with the publisher of trying to get over that she didn't really believe the story, but all the same she needed to write a book about what was a first-rate UFO case to make a living and felt that the story ought to be told um, and in fact it it's now seems to end up in a rather unfortunate way where other investigators are going to pick up with, with a, a much less care than she's done the first book on a sequel which is going to have all sorts of horrendous material included in it all sorts of speculative nonsense about the nature of the universe and whatever but I, I, th I think this is something that <coughs> we've all got to be very careful of if we start preaching about UFOs is not to put our public opinions and hopes private opinions and hopes in into public form as if it's gospel because a lot of people will take it as gospel I would buy any book by Keel or Valet, <coughs> unless you photocopied it for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, may I just make, make a few remarks on the on two of the authors? I don't know very much about uh, uh, Jay Clark, but uh, I know Scott Robert personally, mm -hmm. because he's, uh, he's, he's quite, quite a young man. He's written an enormous number of books, some would say, and you write them too quickly. But uh, I, I think he's uh, uh, quite a knowledgeable person. And uh, I think the, the great advantage which Scott Robo has over, in fact, everybody else who writes in the research is that he really understands parapsychology. He's a member of the, the professional body, the full uh, member of the parapsychology organization. And uh, I think his book on, on uh, uh, the, the recent book you referred to, Miracles, yeah. uh, on the abduction, I, I, I find it very interesting. Uh, now, now John, John Keel, I think he's even more of a journalist. Now, I read the, uh, the Trojan Horse uh, some years ago, and I, I found it uh, very stimulating. Uh, but uh, I must say, I was, I was rather put off uh, by his 
deliberate ignorance of archaeology. I mean, there's a statement she makes I absolutely hair raising, and this is the sort of thing I, uh, I'm a rather uh, too much of a purist to not be put off by that sort of thing, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's quite stimulating why I never I think if anything, Scott Rogo's problem is that uh, he's found that if you write quick, balls, quick, co- quick books about phone calls from the dead or UFO abductions, they raise money far more quickly than do long, complicated books about parapsychology. Yes, I think he has to, be able to make a living out of it. Which is a problem that anyone who's trying to do that is going to face. I mean, how many full-time ufologists are there in this country? I think just the one. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that there are two, uh, there's not two separate things. I'm saying that there is a, a trigger phenomena, that something happens to people, um, whether, as Hillary says, it is merely, in the last event, a ball of light, and I think it just might be. Um, that seems to be the, the, one, the thing we finally come down to, that's at the base of everything, is, is a sort of a, a, a circle or a circular type shape of light. It seems to be at the basis of most UFO sightings of one kind and another, even if it later develops into something. And I think that we're talking about a root phenomena that has produced different effects over the centuries. And that for the greater part of the time, for various reasons, that effect has been seen in religious terms. And the reports have been involved in one way or another, in one religion or another. <coughs> well, I th- <laughs> yes, this is, this is a good one, actually. Because in the Welsh Revival material I looked over, um, most of it derives from... Physical, the physical presence of one middle-aged, not very bright, lady evangelist. And it does seem... Now, I'm prepared to accept that, that in Wales in 1904, early 1905, people... You could go to North Wales, even if you were an outsider and not involved in the religious fervour of revival, which was tremendous. I mean, it was a really huge movement. It was the most dramatic revival for 60, 70 years, and certainly there has been nothing like it since. But I think you could go there objectively, as did reporters from two or three national newspapers, and wait by the side of the road outside the tiny little chapel at Egrin, on between Barmouth and Harlech. And if you stood there for long enough, you would see lights, balls of light about that big, dancing up and down, bursting, forming shapes, hanging over the chapel. If Mary Jones was going to be there the next night, or had been there the previous night, or was there on the night you were watching, that seemed to be the sort of time span. Now, my tendency of belief, I, I, I tend to believe that one can, to some extent, create things by will or affect energy by will. There seems to be a reasonable amount of evidence to support that's enough to make me feel quite happy with it as a theory. And I think that her desire to be the person who would convert her own district was so strong that once she found that if light phenomena were produced, people would come to her chapel and be converted by her, then in some way she started producing light phenomena. Um, I think there was a direct relation between her unconscious will for the phenomena to continue and the fact that they did so. Um, in fact, I won't go into the details of the thing, but she had had the source of life that makes it, would make her the perfect poltergeist victim. Um, she was an incredibly hung up lady. She'd lost children. She'd been orphaned. She'd had a totally miserable life. She lost her faith. She'd had a dramatic conversion experience. And at the time of the dramatic conversion experience, her one aim in mind from never speaking a word in her local chapel at all was to convert not only her own little district but a large part of North Wales and that she duly did. And once the large part of North Wales was converted and the revival started to lose force in the south where it had originally come from into the March, April and going into May 1905 um, so the light phenomena became less and less frequent. They gradually dwindled so that they were only seen specifically where she was indoors. Uh, The last reports I can find are of that and there's nothing more afterwards. Actually, funny enough, this is something we were talking about at the ASAP do earlier. I think there are a variety of explanations. 
um, obviously the, the most natural one is that children are naturally psychic and that it's something we lose with age and I think there is certainly some evidence to suggest that. I think even the SPR have, have produced some evidence to suggest that there is ability in young children that doesn't exist later in life. But uh, one specific case actually relates to this, talking about, funny if you mentioned the word grandfather, I recently did an investigation in Nuneaton with Mark Brown, the um, let's just, uh, RIC, he wrote about most of the report, but the lady was in fact a, she was like the, the local fortune teller. Um, she works in a supermarket on a checkout and people go to her to ask her who to marry. Um, she, fills all, she fills the old sort of witch doctor role in, in terms of predictions. Um, you know, it's, it's almost a sort of gypsy approach to it. But she'd had two very, very convincing CE2s, very convincing indeed. I think we were prepared to accept that there was a, a large degree of truth in what she was saying. Um, but she, her first experience was when she was about 12 or 13, which she was extraordinarily perceptive about because she saw a ball of light in her bedroom. And she said to me, when I, uh, the first time I saw her on the investigation, I saw this ball of light, my grandfather had recently died, and it would have been the sensible thing to think it was the face of my grandfather. But I'm not at all sure it was. I can't remember now if it was the face of my grandfather or if that was my explanation for the ball of light. Um, and in fact, she got a, a catalogue of, of, of UFO incidents that gradually developed in intensity over the next sort of 15, 16 years. But um, th there were some doubts as to whether it was in fact a human face she saw or whether it was a ball of light. And again, I'm not sure if it isn't natural for children to interpret an unknown phenomena in some way they would understand. But some of the visions of, of adults or playmates or whatever seen are so clear that I think we've got to consider other explanations as well. I, th I think there is a, is, is a great deal to be made of the idea that there is a small basic trigger phenomenon that is very similar in a lot of cases which people embroider according to need and conditioning. Um, where children stand in that, I'm not sure. My own children have, have managed to see absolutely nothing at all to my great disappointment. I keep on breeding them in the hope that I'm going to come up with a master psychic. Who could, but um, nothing yet. <laughs> really difficult that one, isn't it? <laughs> you know that. I can't say what causes that to happen. I can say that it is wondrous that either, we've got two choices, either a lot more people have heard accounts of abduction cases, detailed accounts of abduction cases, in a lot of obscure parts of the world. I mean, either a large part of the population of Mexico and Uruguayan places are reading FSR secretly. Um, or there is some sort of communication, there is some sort of level at which people are picking up knowledge about this form, or, or there's a third choice, and that, that it's true, and I don't believe that. I'm not prepared to accept that dirty great spacecraft land near main roads. Nobody notices them, nobody notices them on radar, nobody notices the EM effects, and they take people in them for a period of hours and dump them back on a road, um, occlude their memory in some way, so that some tin pot hypnotist in some market town can dig the details out of them at huge length and vast expense. Later on, it just doesn't make a whit of sense. Now, uh, all right, I mean, I can be accused of trying to make, trying to think that the UFO phenomena ought to make sense, and I, and I wouldn't go along with that. But it is absolutely ludicrous. So I think we're left with two choices: either that there is an unconscious knowledge of the UFO phenomenon and the forms it takes, or there is some way in which people who have this kind of experience pick up from one another what the archetypal experience is. And of course, Alvin Lawson's work with um, fake abduction experiences. I don't know how many people have come across Lawson's paper. I don't think it's quite as sound as it at first appeared, but what he did was he chose a number of imaginative students at a university in the States, um, imagine, sort of English literature students, basically, um, who would be likely to have a high level of imagination, but had definitely not, to his knowledge, had a UFO experience. Put them under hypnosis, asked the usual form of key phrases, not the sort used by Frank Johnson, but the sort used by proper investigators who are trying to get an objective response, and came up with pretty much archetypal UFO abduction experiences um, when they hadn't had them. Um, I say there has been some doubt cast on that, but I think the germ of it is there, that um, it, it is something that can be picked up. It's, yeah. it's published in America. Um, it's 
available from about two shops in the UK, as far as I'm aware, neither of which I live anywhere near. You can subscribe very cheaply. What it is, I mean, you, do you know Prediction that's published in this country? It's, it's like Prediction published, uh, printed on Eisel and about twice as long. Um, it's, it's appalling looking. It's full of adverts for um, build your own pyramid in the back garden and be safe from nuclear disaster and keep your razor blade sharp. <laughs> but the, the editors... for. <laughs> The editors, fortunately, are all quite sound. I mean, Scott Rogo and Jerome Clark are actively involved at a senior level. And what they do is, among all this total junk, they slip in two or three articles of considerable worth by people like Hilary Evans um, every month. Um, there's usually one or two names you've heard of. And some of the best stuff published in the States put, appears there, in fact. Why is it called Fate? Um, why is it called Fate? If you were going to publish a magazine that you wanted people to buy pyramids in the back garden and keep their razor blades <laughs> sharp, wouldn't you call it Fate? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen in the Sorry? I think it did originally, didn't it? I'm I'm not as old as you, Lionel, but I, I think <laughs> the gentleman in the red pullover, yes. The link between what sort of link between the two? Let me ask you a little bit more specific. Between um, the idea of um, and yeah, it's an increasingly common viewpoint. This, I think, I mean, I, as it happens, I read a lot of evangelical literature. Um, it's something that interests me a lot. Um, partly, perhaps, because I look at it from the other side. I think to myself. There's a lot in this evangelical stuff that has a lot to do with UFOs rather than the other way around. But I th yes, I think there's a tremendous overlap between what's been interpreted as demonology in the past and what we're interpreting as ufology now. Um, I don't think I'm happy to go along with people who say, as, as a lot of people have recently, that UFOs are directly products of demonic intervention sent to mislead humanity. I think the evidence for that is about as great as the evidence that they come from Venus, e.g. nil. Um, and I know that, w with particularly with um, the evangelical movement, there is this belief that anything, be it UFOs or Ouija boards or playing the piano excessively, that takes one's mind off Christianity, no, I'm being serious, <laughs> that takes one's mind off Christianity is bad because it misleads one from what one should be putting one's attention to. And I can see entirely that point that if one gets involved in this sort of field, particularly initially when you're young, it tends to take your mind off things, something rotten. Um, you can get very obsessed with it. Um, it takes up a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of mental energy. But I don't think that there is any evidence to suggest that um, anomalous phenomena are in any way products of an evil entity, of an evil intelligence anywhere. Though, uh, as I say, I do think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of similarity between historical records of religious phenomena, um, and particularly demonology. Which one is it? Is the, which one is it? The uh, some trust in chariots. I've, I've not read it. I should like to get hold of that. Yeah. Well, evidence of what? Well, evidence that there could possibly be a link between um, a cult forces um, that are perhaps propagating UFOs. I, I, I think there's a link between the types of experience, most certainly. I, th I think when I was talking about Mary Jones and producing flashing lights over one's chapel, sort of, you know, like a neon sign to attract people to it, I think there's a very close link with need between that and, say, traditional forms of magic, be it white or black. <coughs> the idea that you, you sit down and you perform a ceremony to concentrate your will, 
to produce a particular effect. I, I don't think there's, there's more than a hair's breadth of difference, except that in one case it's conscious and one it's unconscious. And funnily enough, unconscious effects work far better. I mean, I don't know of any magicians who could do more than shift a matchbox up and down the aisle here. You know, they, they couldn't possibly produce flashing lights in the sky. Yes, yes, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Gentleman in the front. Yes. I believed in the New Age in 1969. I, I was a little late for being a hippie, but I tried my best, and I honestly believed in the whole thing. I've, I'm monstrously disillusioned now. Um, really, I, I think a lot of us, I say a lot of us, when we went to, we were, had a new phone, new phone conference at Birmingham, and a lot of the people there, um, we suddenly realised we were all ageing hippies. And we, were all, we had all started off believing in the New Age and better things for mankind and love, peace and brotherhood and stick a flower in the barrel of a gun and we'd all grown old and cynical, except for the fact that the interest that had developed at that stage in things paranormal had lasted and grown and changed. And there was still this sort of, um, if you like, it's the one unexplored bit of the universe left. And there was, there was still that sort of innocent fascination that um, one, one could carry on in this field, and there was still something of the old feeling to it. You know, it, it wasn't quite like taking acid in a field with, with Pink Floyd playing, but you know, it, it was something similar, and it, you know, it was worth a try. I, I think that the, the Armageddon thing is something that we weren't thinking about 10, 15 years ago. But now we're approaching the year 2000, and this is yet another of my fascinations. I, I, I spend far too much time doing this as well, um, is, is, is the idea of Armageddon. And this again ties in with the gentleman at the back, because I find a lot of the evangelical material quite fascinating with regard to predictions of the end of the world, because they're getting more and more specific. And unfortunately, a lot of them are appearing more and more accurate, which is horrifying. I mean. I've got books published 10, 15 years ago. I've got one in my bag, um, which st is predicting events that 40% of them probably have happened, and that's a lot better than the average medium or fortune teller could do. Yes, sir. I, th I think it's true to say there is very... Uh, in a recent um, Common Ground, in number three, I um, ran a bit about John Allen, um, you've probably come across, and he makes some very valid comments and deeds about um, the fact that research in this sort of field, not so much UFOs, but more, say, psychical research and magic and whatever, doesn't seem to make for very happy people. But I think there's something... Uh, th there's a, a chicken and egg situation here, because, in fact, it tends to be unhappy people that make the best psychics. Uh, a number of people have pointed out that being miserable in your early life, coming of a divorced home, being beaten up, homosexually seduced, all sorts of other things, is likely to bring out powers to compensate for that. If there is some latent ability in you, be it to, to do something exceptional physically or to be a psychic, it seems to bring it out. Um, <coughs> Yeah, there, there's a heck, a heck of a lot of difference, yes. I mean, a, a, a cult is a term I don't like to use because it, it means n everything and nothing. Demonology is, is a very specific term, um, which... No, I mean, the occult would include demonology to me, but certainly demonology wouldn't include the whole range of the occult. Demonology is, is, is a very specific phrase referring to 
if, if you like, the idea that there is a sort of ordered society of, uh, of evil forces, um, sort of starting at the top and finishing at the bottom, and, like I said in the talk, interacting with us here and now by, by their own will. No, I don't think it it's, it's taken to mean it. I mean, it, th this is, I think, something that um, there is, has been a tendency to do, is that occult equals evil, um, equals all the things that we all here probably are interested in. But I, I think it's a very poor word. Well, it only means hidden, after all. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, some people depend on mother's milk and meat would kill them. Some of them are ready for the meat. You know what I mean? So it is with so called demon over here, no cause and everything else. Who is ready to eat meat, meat will not hurt them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Somebody who is not ready for it, for him it is something strong, <coughs> which can uh, do him harm. Yes, the same, go the same is true of mountain climbing. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. It's, a, it's a question of doing what you're able to do, and what you've been trained to do, and what you're experienced in doing. And, th and the best way to do anything is to do it with somebody else who knows how to do it. This is a sort of dualist idea, which, which is sort of one of the early forms of Christianity. And I, I don't actually personally accept the idea that there is a, a, a positive force out there working for good or a positive force out there working for evil. Um, I, I tend to think we're, we're on our own on this one. But, uh, <laughs> I've got no evidence to offer for that. Two <laughs> last questions, ladies and gentlemen, because your tea and coffee will be going cold if we don't break quickly. Manfred? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm walking along in the country in Spain, which I'm... I'm at a little peasant boy, about 78 years old, and uh, what do I see? I see a little figure, uh, which is described as a thing. It's a, it's like a very small child, about two or three years old, and it's wearing a red cape with golden hair, and I'm absolutely terrified by it. But uh, because this is the year uh, 1450, let's say, and of course I'm a, I'm a Catholic, yeah, I'm told this is the Virgin Mary. Yes. I think it's always worth stressing that, that when the first version of Bernadette at Lourdes was seen, she was seen as a child not yet entering puberty, as a yeah. child the same well, height as the witness. Um, now, when you see statues of Bernadette, you do not see pictures of a young child. No, you do not see I'm statues of a young child. This is good, this is bad. Uh, obviously, if you, if you interpret it as something Christian, uh, uh, in the Christian context, this is a version of Mary, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, it's something quite private. If you happen to be in Ireland at the same time, you'd interpret it as uh, uh, something different. Do you mean? Yeah. Would you like to kick off the question well, immediately well, after? Well, that's on those lines, really. Um, I was hoping. Yeah, well, I believe it was featured at last year's before a conference, which is why I cut it down. <laughs> no, well, nor was I. <laughs> could, could I suggest that, that we ask Kevin to, to kick off after, the, uh, after we've had we'll our break the tea, with that thing? Because you'll be staying, won't you? Yes. Good, OK. Thanks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'd better do it as soon as we come back, Lionel, because let's get it.
that I'd just like to remedy a, something I didn't do which I should have done at the beginning of our meeting tonight and that was we are fortunate enough to have with us tonight all the way from Toronto Michael Sinclair on my right here gentleman sitting down very glad to have him uh, he's uh, active in the same uh, organization I believe as uh, David Hazel who spoke to us at the International Congress last year we have also got a uh, lady from uh, States from Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, it's Betty, uh, Becky Azen. She's, oh here she is, that's right, in the centre. So welcome, glad to have you from over the water. Uh, Lana, would you like to yep. make your right, okay. Um Just a quick summary of forthcoming events. Um, next weekend in Edinburgh is our annual conference. Uh, it's a little bit smaller this year. It's uh, although people can assemble on Friday evening, it will be mainly uh, the duration of the Saturday. Um, do we know who our speakers are? The the main sort of emphasis, I think, or the high focal point of this particular conference is a symposium on the Livingstone encounter case, where the forestry worker saw this uh, uh, metallic. Uh, ball-shaped object and was attacked by two sort of sea mines that grabbed his trousers and pulled him into the ground, apparently. And um, the uh, great thing about the uh, symposium is that I understand that a local police officer who was involved at the time, a representative of Livingstone Development uh, Corporation, uh, presumably his uh, uh, Mr. Taylor's boss, uh, forestry uh, manager, will be there and I think somebody else. Um, so the whole case will be examined in a lot of detail and um, the sort of um, high point, as it were, will be a visit to the actual site in the forestry area in the Livingstone district, so we'll a bit out of Edinburgh, but transport will be laid on on the Sunday morning for those people who are willing to stay overnight. What are the other? I think one of the interesting things too is that the actual recipient of the event uh, Robert Taylor, who was the forestry worker in, in this case, will be present. And uh, whilst he's not uh, making any speeches or anything like that, I understand that he is willing to um, thank you, to be um, answer questions. And I think this is something that in our development of cases that uh, seem to stand up to the uh, unexplained, that we could do more of having the actual witnesses uh, present and this is one of the things we hope to do on this occasion and um, there will be uh, yeah. certain other speakers yes. there. Uh, I just thought uh, people who are fans of uh, Jenny Randall's um, I believe she's uh, doing a session in the morning yes, um, yes. plus I think we've, we're hoping for a scientist to give a suitable paper as well um, Am I right in thinking that details are available outside or from the treasurer yes, or, they or are whoever? Yes, they are outside. There's the agenda and the. Uh, if anybody thinks set. they might possibly sort of like a weekend in Edinburgh next weekend and hasn't sort of seen anything about it, get the details. Right. Um, moving on till March the 20th, that, in fact, there's two uh, meetings which clash. Um, I understand that's the date of the annual general meeting of contact. UK. Um, I'm at a slight disadvantage because I haven't got any meeting details with me. I understand that uh, they're having a slide illustrated lecture. Has anybody got the actual uh, meeting details with them that I can just uh, recite? Contact UK. I know it's going to be in the Oxford area. No? Um, yes, this is one of the problems that um, although we uh, have good relations with Contact UK that uh, we don't often exchange with them very often. 
Anyway, if you want to go to Oxford on March the 20th, make a note. Otherwise, um, I'm going to plug this very hard. We have a meeting of ASAP, <coughs> and we, are, we have the uh, privilege and pleasure of having many members of the newly formed society, um, the Association for Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, um, with us tonight. And is uh, Mr. Merrill here? Right, OK. Well, I did make some preliminary detail and take some notes. And on 20th, Saturday, 20th of March, starting at 10.30 in the morning and probably finishing round about 6 o'clock in the evening, for a very um, attractive fee of uh, either £3 or £3.50, you have four in what, who are, in my opinion, extremely interesting speakers. Uh, Paul Devereux, who's into ley lines and uh, similar practical field research. Uh, anybody who's seen Paul Devereux at the uh, Bufora meetings know that his presentation, accompanied by colour slides, is absolutely fascinating, first class, and speaking for myself personally, I could sit through it half a dozen times. Um, they've also got John Steele. Can you remind me what his particular field is? Psychic archaeology. Psychic archaeology. Um, it was mentioned to me that uh, he was interested in the Bimini underwater stones, which some people say has something to do with Atlantis, but uh, I'm not too sure about that. But certainly the archaeology part of it uh, is uh, very interesting. Um, and presumably we would be told that something about how he arrived at these conclusions. Uh, has he written sort of any books or papers on the subject? No, he's, he's actually been doing active research, I gather, on the Bimini. Right. Um, the, the actual artefacts themselves underwater, presumably, right. his wellies. Now, my third name is Adrian Schein. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I know that he has put in a lot of practical field work up at uh, both Loch Ness, and I think particular emphasis in Schein's case is that he spent time uh, not looking so much for Nessie, but looking for Morag, which is the lady monster who's supposed to inhabit Loch Marar, and I can assure you that Loch Ness and Loch Marar are quite a lot different from each other. Um, so he's a monster expert. Um, sorry, have I said the wrong thing? Um, we're also going to have a, a young chap who's uh, very enthusiastic, Jeff Watson. He's not here tonight, is he? Uh, who's also into sea monsters and lake monsters and um, environmental um, subjects sort of as a supporting uh, speaker I think, is that the right way to put it? Um, I imagine that uh, these will all be slide illustrated. And the fourth name is Nigel Pennick, who I understand will be acting as chairman uh, of the day as well. Now I know Nigel Pennick has uh, written a book possibly books on, how, how would you define the subject? Well, he, he runs the Institute for Geomantic Research and he's, yeah. he, he's written a lot of, he's written some very popular, very, very complex material about um, geomancy, sort of make, make up of buildings, is it sort of mathematically and spiritually significant, and he's also done a lot of research on terrestrial zodiacs, mazes, yeah. well, I think you name it, he's done it. If you've read either Common Get Ground or Fortean Times, you probably find articles by him. Has he contributed? Not yet, no. not yet. No. Well, that's been Fortean uh, oh, Times yes. then. Yeah. And um, Lay Hunter. So I'm convinced that he's a, a good uh, man to listen to as well. So anyway, that's. Uh, 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 so I didn't quite catch the dinner. I got 10 30. No, I that's right. I must, I must give you. You can. <laughs> no, wait a minute. I've got to bring it down here. Let me just uh, check it out. Yes. Now, you take the tube to Tufnell Park. Um, got the wrong piece of paper. And then you. Uh, Tufnell Park is between Camden Town and uh, the Archway, or between Camden Town and Highgate. And you go to a place called Huddlestone Road, um, and then there's a University Hall of Residence there. And I've been there today, and I can tell you that the um, facilities are quite good. Yes, that's right. There's uh, refreshments available. You can have lunch there. There's a bar. Um, so it's all quite well appointed. And I'm sure that any members of ASAP will be happy to sort of give you the address details if you need them. 
Uh, no, Tuffnell no. Park. Oh. Look, 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 looks more like you're in Toxted, actually. Any, any <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mustn't spend too long on this because um, Kevin, Kevin's got to go fairly soon. I've been waffling on too long as it is. I just remind you that uh, we've got a meeting on the 3rd of April when Peter Hill, our Director of Research, will be speaking. And uh, I've just been given a, a notice about a meeting for the Society of Psychical Research, Presidential Address, Psychic, Psychical Research After 100 Years, What Do We Really Know? Sounds rather challenging title. By Professor Arthur Ellison, Professor of Electrical Engineering, City of University, London. That's uh, Monday, 24th May, at 7 p.m. at the Royal Society, 6 Carlton House Terrace. Details from Mr. Casera, I think. Thank you. Um, so, do you want to? Do you want to take over the chair? Excuse me, can, can I put in a plug for another Ashtap Daily, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, for any of you of an adventurous spirit with a Saturday to spare, on April the 17th, um, Asap and or me are putting on a, a do in Leicester um, with a lot of speakers at a central Leicester hotel. <coughs> it's only an hour and a half from St Pancras by train, and it's only about 200 yards from the station. We have got a, a wide variety of speakers. Hilary Evans, the, the gentleman in the canary colour jumper there, is talking about a... French abduction case, an illustrated investigation he's just finished. Um, Jenny Randalls is going to talk about some new uh, research and regression, hypnotic regression that she's been doing, um, the first sort of revelation of its results. We've got Paul Begg, the author of Into Thin Air. Um, chap has um, gone into a lot of the sort of myths like Bermuda Triangle, um, the disappearing regiment, um, the chap who disappears in the middle of a field and people hear his voice. Uh, he's done a lot of the original research on that. He's coming. Um, uh, a gentleman called Bob Cracknell, who's a, a psychic whose book you may have seen around called Clues to the Unknown, he's been on the radio and whatever. Hopefully he's going to be demonstrating. He's, uh, if I can get him to demonstrate, it'll be the third time in five or six years, and he's terrific. If not, he'll be talking about his, his work with criminal investigation as a psychic. This, this is at the Grand Hotel in Leicester. What I'll do is I'll make sure details are here for the next Blue Forum meeting, so Thank you. I can read out a bit more detail. It's only going to be £2 for the day. But you'll have to find your own lunch because it costs about eight quid at the hotel. I don't suppose anybody's going to be interested in that. And uh, I've forgotten the other person I'm going to have speaking. Sue Blackmore of the SPR, um, either talking about deathbed experiences, she's been doing some research in local hospitals on an SPR grant, or about um, out-of-body experience. It'll run from 11 o'clock till 5, which gives you time to have a reasonable breakfast in London and still get there, and uh, get back and have a reasonable supper. And uh, I, I hope it's, it'll, you know, hopefully it's going to be on a fairly grand scale, and hopefully uh, it'll be a good day. It almost illustrates the impossibility of trying to organise ASAP as a coherent whole. Uh, it's just sort of five of the subjects that fall within its, its view and uh, it's barely scratching the surface, but uh, I think it should be worth coming to if anyone would like to. Delighted to see you. I'll, so we'll put out details and I'll be sending out tickets in about two, three weeks' time uh, for anyone who wants to come. Thank you, Kevin. If you can make sure we get uh, a copy I of that, certainly will. then yes, we can I photocopy promise. it and have it available here for I'll, 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 all I'll all have enough copies done. And put okay. it That's lovely. Thank you. Right, Kevin, could I ask you to start off this next session then, picking up the point made by the lady in the front, that uh, you would possibly commence on the Fatima uh, yes. What would you like me to say about Fatima? He's just madly trying to rack his brains to remember what he knows about it. Well, I said uh, well, I, I, it was a question more than a statement. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Um, Fatima, you probably know a lot about the case, occurred over a period of, I think it was six separate incidents at monthly intervals on the 17th of each month. By the third month, I would say that it was more expectation than it was um, independent, spontaneous event. Um, I think it was 3,000 people on the third occasion. By the time you've got 3,000 people waiting for a miracle, um, it's extraordinarily likely that you're going to get a miracle of some kind. But initially, the, 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 fir the starter off there was what was claimed to be a sighting of the Virgin Mary, a, and a vision of the Virgin Mary. Now, how that vision first grew, I don't think any of us are ever going to know. One of the problems, well, two, two problems with Fatima. Firstly, we've all got dreadfully confused with the final event, with this report of the Dance of the Sun. 
um, which appears, which has been related as all sorts of different things, but seems to have come down as, as our myth, our idea of it now is this UFO doing a falling leaf motion um, while the sky went dark. The implication doesn't seem to be that the sun ever stopped shining, as, as far as one can tell from contemporary material. Certainly not everyone in the crowd saw the phenomenon. Um, it is said that there was a fall of angel hair or rose petals or whatever interpretation you put on it. Of course, it's only been angel hair since we thought about angel hair in connection with UFOs in 1917. Uh, the story was rose petals because that was one of the things that happened um, with statues of the Virgin Marys that you would occasionally do. You get a certain quantity of rose petals will appear by the statue of the Virgin Mary and it would appear to be a, a sort of gift from heaven, an apples in spiritualist terms. Um, uh, it's, it's, again, it's chicken and the egg, but in, in the case of Fatima, certainly the children came back with the report of the vision before anyone started seeing balls of light. Um, but then you had got a stage where, say, by the fourth and fifth appearances, people were seeing both. Different people were seeing different things, but both were being seen. The children were still seeing the Virgin conversing, whole, you know, quite a lively relationship developing between them. And meanwhile, some very respectable people claimed to be seeing lights floating along, rain coming out of a cloudless sky, um, the, the branches of the evergreen oak in which the figure was said to appear each time, um, fluttering in, in a, in a, in a, again in a windless air. Um, it's, it's probably beyond satisfactory investigation now. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it was ever satisfactorily investigated at the time. There is, in fact, some, some incredible predictive material about Fatima, which other people know far more about than I do. Um, but it was, there are all sorts of hints and promises of it coming before it ever came, um, and hints and promises that I don't think that the children involved can ever have been aware of. Of course, the other thing that's made it all so confusing is the prophecies that have emerged from it since which, um, with all due respect to anyone present who believes in them, appear to be the classic place of prophecies being released after the event. Um, the, the prophecies of the Russian Revolution actually happened after the Russian Revolution. The prophecies of the start of the Second World War were released after 1940. Uh, we're now hanging on the prophecies of the end of the world, uh, which is one of these wonderful things to predict, because if it comes, we're not going to care, and if it doesn't, then... <laughs> Um, it's, it's a fascinating series of events for Tim, as I say, it's, it strikes me it's rather like North Wales. It's now beyond proper investigation. So you're not prepared to make any statement on what the entity was that we've seen? Bear in mind that the first vision was about uh, 1916, and Lucia said it was of a, uh, a body wrapped in a sheet with no head. She made no statement. Which what, you're talking about the the, this, this prevision? Yes, in the same way that Bernadette called her vision that thing. That's right. Yeah, uh, or something, wasn't it? Yeah. <coughs> Funny enough, I've only recently come across this pre-vision thing. It, I've, I've just done an article about um, Blessed Virgin Mary visions for The Unexplained, two articles. And I didn't include that because the source I'd got for it was very vague. Um, it hasn't been part of the literature, it hasn't been part of most of the literature through most of the last 40, 50 years on any sort of scale. And I'm not sure quite how well it was reported before the 1917 events ever started. Uh, you obviously know more about it than I do, to be quite honest. But you aren't prepared to make any... Well, I, I would say that, again, you've got a situation where, uh, as Manfred said earlier, if, if you expect to see the... If you see a figure, you're a good Catholic child, and you have heard of ver visions of the Virgin, as Bernadette Subaru had, had, had been associated with a, a shrine not far from Lourdes. I'm racking my brains from to remember the name. Um, no, it's gone. But she'd, been, she'd spent some time going to a shrine when she was staying away from home. And uh, there was certainly an expectation in Bernadette's mind that people would see visions of the Virgin Mary. So if she saw a, a, a figure-like shape or even a, a, a stationary light object, it is only too likely that, uh, by way of interpretation, it would be the Virgin Mary. Because the Virgin Mary was the only vision people saw. It was the only acceptable vision. Well, I'm not suggesting it was the Virgin Mary. I think it's no. what you think it was. I'm, I'm saying that I haven't... Basically, I haven't the least idea what it was. Uh, <laughs> how can I possibly? For hundreds of years, second day, that's what people don't realise. Before Fatima man and you people have been seeing this, this version uh, since the Middle Ages. Yes, in, in, in different sort of ways. In um, different ways. So like yeah. I mean, it, it became very, much, oh, pardon me, yeah. became very much formalised um, with the Immaculate Conception of material. But it could also be Saint Michael and, uh, and uh, other figures. Yes, I mean Joan of Arc, obviously. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, this is another aspect of, 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 of the power of visions. I mean, you can say that Joan of Arc was, was possibly, I mean, we're now being told that she was genetically male. Um, perhaps we're talking, well, perhaps we're talking again about somebody with a heck of a lot of problems. Who, who will, no, seriously. 
<laughs> I think the lady there would like to ask a question on this. No, I think, certainly I think the Cheetham, which is the most recent translation I've come across, I think is, is probably very sound. I mean, my French is pretty crummy, but um, people I've spoken to who know a good deal more French than I have seem to think that their uh, translations are, are fairly fine. They're, uh, leaving aside the end of the world business, the one disturbing thing about Nostradamus <coughs> is that you can pick over the last 300 years and find some quatrains which have been interpreted as dead accurate in a large variety of ways. They have meant different things to different people at different times. Um, Pre-French Revolution, they've met one thing uh, regarding the French monarchy. Post-Revolution, they've met meant incidents during the Revolution, and so on and so on. Um, e even, the his even the Histoquois train was, was interpreted differently in the early 1800s. Uh, there was a perfectly sound interpretation of the Histoquois train put out in the early 1800s connected with the Napoleonic Wars. Um, nobody had even thought of Hitler then. Um, or th but now it's, the, now it's Hitler. Um, now there's no... Um, with regard to the end of the world, Nostradamus runs closely in with a heck of a lot of other material. Um, there is, as there was running up to 1000 AD, as there was running up to 100 AD for what we know of it, um, a great weight of material developing. Um, all right, things like Mother Shipton are in terms of, of dates fakes, but you've, you've, there's little doubt that the concepts in Mother Shipton put forward of, of forms of aerial transport were put forward before 1903. Um, there's little doubt that some aspects of Nostradamus have got to be seen as having some ray of accuracy in them. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not a total cynic by any means, otherwise I wouldn't waste so much time on these subjects. But um, I, don't, I don't really accept that the end of the world is going to come as Nostradamus suggests, um, all these warring factions or whatever, it's terribly detailed. But so again are 150, 200 other people's visions of the end of the world. And particularly that the vision of the world, end of the world in Revelation does not concur with Nostradamus. Um, a lot of people who come 1997 are going to be believing in Nostradamus. A lot of people are going to be believing in Revelation. I mean, I've always said that my, my aim in life for a living, come about 1990, is to be the person that the BBC ring up when they want someone to appear on Newsnight to talk about the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be that much of a thing. There, you, you will be swamped with books. We'll, f we'll forget about sensible paranormal research come then. And we will all be talking about the end of the world. Um, everybody. Well, of course, then everybody will think they were right, just for those few brief moments. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the tricky things, you see. I think that when most of these predictions were made, people could envision a physical um, sort of blight being placed upon the earth by, by an angry god, um, bringing about the end of the world. But then you've got the, the concept that there is going to be sort of heaven on earth for a certain number and heaven in, heaven in heaven for a certain number of others and God knows what will happen to people like me but if you've got the concept of nuclear holocaust you can't really posit a, a vast area on earth where, where the saved are going to live happily the, the, the two things aren't, two theories aren't really consonant um, you, you can't have heaven on, a, on an earth that's full of fallout so really you're going to have two lines of, of, of thought going on now, Nostradamus is, is really nearer the biblical than a lot of the more modern things, because he's saying that, you know, trial and tribulation over. We'll all live happily ever after till the next time. Um, but a lot of them now, obviously, are thinking in terms of Holocaust. And this is where you get the little groups coming in. Again, we'll see this. Again, we'll, we'll get another great movement, a sort of ufological Jehovah's Witnesses, who will be expecting to be taken away in saucers. I was talking to Bob Rickard, the editor of 14 Times, the other night, and he's got a wonderful clipping from an Australian paper that there was a... Um, a scare in a, a coastal area in Australia that the end of the world was coming. I can't remember what the cause of it was going to be. And whereas in most countries, it was going to come by flood from the sea. It was going to be a massive tidal wave and, and swamp a vast part of inland Australia. And whereas in most countries you would head for the hills, the Australians bought up the maximum amount of beer they could find and went and sat on the beach. 
It, it stirs me that Revelation was accepted as, as, as being meaningful in the run up to 1000 AD as well. I mean, the, the, I mean then obviously the, the effects were very considerable. There were great armies of people wandering around Europe um, expecting the end, beating themselves with flails and things. Um, odd reaction for the, for the last sort of few years. But I, th I think Revelation has been monstrously misinterpreted. I don't think there's, um, I mean really, you could, you could interpret Revelation, the experience of Revelation in a great many ways. You could interpret it if you like, as an out-of-body experience, you could interpret it as mediumistic. You could make almost anything you like a revelation, and people have made almost everything they like a revelation. Um, Billy Graham's done it recently. Um, it's kind of not exactly a chart, but a sort of list of, of end-time events. Um, Hal Lindsay, who you've probably seen some of the books of, wrote Late Great Planet Earth, and Satan is Alive and Well and Living on Planet Earth, and, and material like that. Um, his, his latest, really very expensive book, is a chart of little units, of sort of third of a page each, picking out events in Revelation as with world events since the end of the Second World War, the key one being, of course, the formation of the State of Israel. Um, and, and from that point on in, it, it, everyone, all, all these writers are saying, there are a great many writers saying, um, Tim, de, Tim de la Haye as well, that uh, the end is coming, it is now completely inevitable. And I, I would agree that, as I say, that over the last 10 years, in books written 10 years ago, you can see some of the events, you can pick them out and say, yes, that has happened, that has happened. But, um, if, if the city of God's on its way, I, I, I cannot see any evidence. Things seem to be getting worse rather than better. The point that uh, our friend in the front made about uh, language, I think, also has an interesting bearing. If taking Nostradamus, which the lady in the centre was referring to, we realise that when Nostradamus wrote those quatrains, what, four or five hundred years ago, the language that he had to use to express what we take for granted uh, what was beyond his understanding if he'd have been a normal person. There was not such a word as atom or atomic. There was not such a word as uh, um, nuclear. There was not such a, a word as uh, rocket. And if you have read the Nostradamus quatrains uh, either in the original French or you've had them translated for you which is the easy way that I adopted Kevin <coughs> when you think of the f some of the quatrains that have never yet been uh, explained in past events according to those people who specialize on the subject 
you think of just one perfect expression that Nostradamus used to demonstrate what we today call nuclear fallout. He said, if you may remember in that quotation, I can't remember where it was now, that hundreds of thousands will die from the false dust. What a wonderful expression for nuclear fallout when nuclear fallout had not been defined. And I think that uh, the point the lady is making that uh, Nostradamus was not an ordinary man has uh, got a lot of validity. Oh yes, I, I think it's true. And he also, of course, he was writing in an age where if he wasn't very careful what he said and if he didn't disguise what he was writing, right. um, it, he'd probably have been he'd burned. burned at the stake. The word yeah. dust might have referred to the volcano and this famous black cloud that's never been traced around the state. Yes, but why false dust? Fallout from the uh, St. Helens volcano hmm. or any other volcano. Yes, but why false? Dust, yes. Yeah, I said the fallout of yeah. dust. Hmm. Yes. But he, he used the word false dust. Yes, F-A-L-S-E. False dust. And what a wonderful expression. Yes, sir. Um, I, I don't like to be a, a pessimist uh, about the uh, coming of the new age. And statements like that, uh, it seems to be getting uh, worse. Um, aren't, aren't exactly. I mean, it uh, like attracts light from that. Mm. It seems that, uh, that any threads we have to grasp onto you know, and get pulled along. Yeah, you know, I, 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 would, I would disagree. Give some energy. But there, I mean, there is a great movement. Uh, I mean, the, the greatest move, as far as I can see, the greatest number of people believing that the world is likely to come to an end in the near future at present is, is the <coughs> moral majority movement that came with Reagan's election in the States which is an incredibly depressing, cynical um, use of religious belief to support political uh, machination. And I'm, I'm quite sure that majority, a large proportion of the moral majority people quite happily accept the, the, the principle that, in, you know, that we are now in end times and um, that that's that part of the whole, the whole mental approach to it. But there is a rebirth. Maybe we're just at the beginning. Well, I say, unfortunately, I, I, I tend to get cynical about that because that's what I, I say well, a lot of us believed 12, 13 years ago. Well, Stephen. you have to look at it over geological. Yeah. Yes, Stephen. Uh, Jesus started his ministry in Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah. Well, everyone's always believed in the new age of one kind or another. I mean, how long has Alice Bailey been going on about the coming new age? Um, and still nothing's happened. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses have had, what, four dry runs at the end of the world now? Yes, yes. Young man in the front. I'd like to, because Christ did say the kingdom of God is within you, but in the same way, the kingdom of God must have a physical manifestation as well. Um, the, uh, the kingdom of God can be found every time you turn to religion. If you have a spiritual experience, you can each individual can have experience um, the kingdom of God, if you like, through a, a sort of aesthetic um, experience, a spiritual experience. If, if I can stop, perhaps to take a chance to be slightly controversial, the, re the religious experience is remarkably like the, the closing county UFO experience. Um, the, 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 the mental and physical effects are, are devastatingly close. I mean, I, I mean, I, without wishing to appear sort of vain or anything, I mean, I, I had what I thought was a, a very dramatic conversion experience and, and succeeded in, in lasting with me for about three, three and a half years. And I, I went round being um, incredibly uh, holy and um, converting people and all sorts of things reasonably effectively. And, seeing sort of visions and dropping on my knees in the middle of a road to pray, all the sorts of, you know, kind of things you do when you're a late adolescent and um, you, you feel emotionally strong about something. You know, other, other people were out to stop the Vietnam War and I, I was proselytizing. Uh, but the experiences are so close. Uh, the experience of revelation about anything, of, of being, of suddenly feeling you're a part of something, of suddenly feeling you understand something, whether it be Christian faith, whether it be UFOs, whether it be, as you say, Baha'i, or any other faith you suddenly feel reborn into, um, it's a great experience. 
but it's then down to the surroundings. I mean, you, you look at little, little Christian groups, um, any little religious group, they support each other like crazy. Um, anyone see the Everyman program the other night about um, the Christi the, that Christian group pottering around Cambridge, um, diving, in, uh, diving into the camp to baptise each other um, without any traditional form of spiritual authority? I mean, they were all balmy together, in, in my humble opinion. I mean, they were, they were all supporting each other. They were a close-knit group, undoubtedly happy, undoubtedly sincere, but start raving mad. Um, and the same goes, you know, we're talking about the little groups that try and build flying saucers. They, they, they believe in the same thing. They support each other very, very strongly. Um, and it, all it is is belief. There isn't any evidence. There is a confirming experience which they have, which is this sort of um, ray of light into the mind or dazzling whatever. Something comes to you. A anyone might remember, I was saying to a gentleman earlier on, um, the Divine Light Mission with Guru Maharaji. Um, where part of the, the experience of enlightenment, uh, part of becoming a premi, was that you were you rubbed your eyes like crazy, and to your total astonishment, you saw light, um, and 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 you, you did things with your ears, and to your total astonishment, you heard things in your ears. Um, it's kind of temporary sort of tinnitus effect, and and this was enlightenment, and and, and Guru Maharaj had afforded it to you, and of course there were just very very simple techniques that people have known for God knows how long. Uh, similarly with TM. Um, for all that you may be chanting a, a mantra, uh, what is basically a, a Hinduistic worship mantra, as far as I can gather, um, which I know a lot of, of Christian people are worried about that aspect of meditation. <coughs> but really, it is only a form of knowledge. And as I understand it, this secret mantra, actually, there's only about 15 of them for all the people practicing TM all over the world. And um, I, I think it's what you do and not in what context you do it that has the effect with, with a thing like meditation. And uh, all these effects, it's because the people are together and believe in the reason for their experience, that they strengthen it and put it out to other people and convert other people into it. Um, I, yeah, I think it's all the same experience along the line. Hilary. I mean, it was much simpler when one believed that religious experiences stopped in 1947 and UFO experiences took over. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just not as, as straightforward as that. No. Gentlemen at the back there. Could we ask which? Would it be rude? Could I won't mention which it is. Oh.
the three, I mean, to connect it, we can't say that one doesn't exist and the other two do. Because if we do that, we're saying that our viewpoint is reality. The other viewpoint is non-reality. In other words, we're taking the position of consciousness and saying our consciousness is a correct state of consciousness because this is how I perceive things. Now, you're asking for proof that the uh, religious experience, perhaps, the spiritual experience, as opposed to a psychic experience. See, the danger <coughs> of defining psychic as something that is neither one thing or another <coughs> is that it is a state of consciousness and a level of being. And the word psychic is the most beneficial word. It's like soul, you know. What is psychic? Well, psychic. We could say, what is physical? What I'm trying to say is that these are different states of reality, they're alternative states of being. To get from one to another is an individual thing. It's a state of consciousness. If we are to say that UFOs and religion are interrelated, then what we're saying is if we have two states of consciousness, we have the ufologist state of consciousness, where they can see or accept the they have a belief, whatever it is, whether it's Jesus Christ or not. Um, what I'm trying to say is that those two are quite valid to the particular participant. Right? Now to, to go further, one, one can relate them to an overall plan and bring in a third constituent, which is the spiritual constituent, because it is automatically assumed that religion is to be correlated with spirit. The two are mm. acceptable. I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, because a spiritual experience is not necessarily a religious experience. Religion is a state of consciousness which is anchored in a certain faith. Yeah. It's yeah. a state of faith. Now, a spiritual experience is not a state of faith. A spiritual experience can be had by anyone at any time, whether or not their thinking mind is on religion. In other words, I, I, th I think the word peak experience correlates quite well there with spiritual experience. Right. Yeah. Okay. It never had any contact with religion, but it could have an experience which could be very similar to an experience related to any of the Bible of the world. Um, what is interesting is that you can then relate that to the UFO phenomena by asking, is the UFO phenomena manipulated phenomena by spirit? or a spiritual intelligence. In other words, is what we see a deliberate manifestation for whatever purpose? Right, if one, if one says, yes, all right, I'll go along with that, then one must go further and say, well, then this is engineered by a race of entities, if you like, of which we could have no part of in our normal state of consciousness. In other words, we mm. open ourselves to saying there are other <coughs> orders yeah. of intelligence on this planet. But they don't have to be spacemen. I'm not saying that no. they necessarily have to be spacemen. I'm not saying they have to be in human form. What I'm saying is that these um, questions are valid. And I'm not saying one can get the answer through scientific um, proof, uh, because they are an individual experience. And to tackle these kind of questions, one has to do it through one's own level of awareness. I know this is really no. avoiding the issue, but you cannot... No, I, I, no I, mean, I think it makes a great deal of sense what you're saying. I think one thing I've been accused of, and very fairly, is that I'm, if not anti-religious, certainly non-religious, <coughs> and certainly non-spiritual. Um, I've got a, a strong tendency to remove the spiritual value from any experience that, that is reported to me, or I, I, of which I read a report. I mean, this is something I've been doing all evening. Is, is shredding away the, the, the love and gentility and pleasantness of reports and, tr and sort of saying, this is something that happens, let's see if we can have a go at working out how it happens, but the cause of its happening is probably a, a random, unexplained experience. And I'm not even trying to account for spiritual um, feelings and spiritual emotions. Um, in, in the course of doing that, there's really not a lot of room for it. The two things are separate. Um, to, I suspect there's a lot of spiritual experience that results from paranormal or anomalous experience, you know, 
a, a shock experience happens that you can't explain. I mean, like, I mean take my conversion experience. I mean, I, I see looking back that I sort of built myself up to it. I've been writing sort of gloomy poetry as one does when one's 18. Um, sort of getting very worked up about singing in a chapel choir at a boarding school and not believing a word of it. And sort of get this, this incredible dazzling, dazing experience that sort of knocks me out for a couple of minutes and leaves me completely different. Um, which is not unlike a sort of a, what Maslow is talking about, Colin Wilson talks about when he's writing about Maslow, as, as peak experiences, which um, some people can induce in themselves. It's, you know, in, in some way adrenaline enumerated. And the spiritual element is, is what you believe that physical experience um, means. spiritual as opposed to religious, that there was no room for spiritual experience in addition to... That you, you could do away with established religion, but you still need the spiritual experience. Yeah. Uh, Dennis? I was going to ask if uh, UFOs were from a spirit dimension, for the best term. Now, why would it be necessary for it to be using powered engines or whatever it causes the light to send the other substances to an what evidence is there that any UFOs ever used a powered engine? <coughs> well, I don't, think you, I don't think you can really say anything about Ezekiel. It's so long since. I, mean, I can't imagine how many times Jewish scholars have rewritten the Bible to suit their own political ends. But. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, how many sound cases are there of where they left marks on the ground? Maybe hundreds. <coughs> Not hundreds. Hundreds of, yeah. of, of rock solid CETOs? Yeah. Yeah. Once he has personally investigated, this is reported, for example, in the published proceedings of the Fate Conference in Chicago. Yeah, so I have seen. And in the MUFON Conference. <coughs> Can you also Probably not, no. <laughs> no, I, I, the, the evidence of. of <coughs> the evidence of physical exist uh, physical solidity of UFOs is I still think minimal. Um it's I mean I I'll, I'll accept your point. I wasn't aware there were so many acceptable cases of, of, of ground effects. Um we're still talking about solid objects that don't appear on radar and stuff, aren't we? In the same cases as the ground effects. No, but the, the nature of the ground effects that Ted built uh, a well known and well respected investigator in the US mm. has written about. Are they mainly downdraft effects or, or impressions? In, 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 some kind of physical effect on the ground, which are usually in, in impressions on the ground and or disruptions to trees and so forth. Yeah. And in, in all of the cases, the, the stimulus for, the, uh, for causing these things is associated with the sighting of some kind of craft. Yeah. You know, in, in, as understood in a traditional view of yeah. So you've got a craft that's solid enough to make indentations, but misses radar and national defences. I mean, there was a recent case in, in the UK, which was a Rendlesham Forest, Forest case, which Jenny Randalls has recently written up, um, where supposedly a, a, a large UFO, a broken down UFO, hovered over a tree in Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk and uh, was repaired in situ while being watched by large numbers of um, officers from both USAF and RAF. Uh, but I think the most valid point in that was made by Peter Warrington, um, UFO investigator, who said that if that UFO had been there, they'd have blasted it out of the sky long before they ever went to watch it in their jeeps. Uh, because well, that, that bit... They would have seen it in the sky coming down. But the fact but that that didn't happen, that doesn't say anything about the validity of the other thing. Um, you see, the fact that all these, that these uh, kinds of cases that Ted Phillips in the U.S. has investigated yeah. um, have not also been picked up on radar, so, so far as is known, yeah. anyway, uh, the fact that you make that point seems to me doesn't say anything about the validity or otherwise of what he has found through his investigation. No, it's, it says that there are ground effects related to, to sightings of lights. Yeah, I'll right. set that quite happily. Right. Yeah. Also oh, about the about the <coughs> That's right. I understand that there were imprints. I understand there is an argument about the imprints. It's a pity Stephen Banks has gone because he knows more about it than I do. But, uh, but if you've read the police evidence of the uh, Livingstone affair, 
there are, as you know, police photographs and measurements and Bufour is producing very shortly, in the next month or so I hope, a case history of the Livingstone affair from beginning to end, which does include the police forensic laboratory reports and the evidence of the police officers that invested that case with their measurements and all the data. And uh, whilst there may be uh, explanations for it, uh, the evidence is pretty solid uh, in terms of uh, depth and photograph and soil samples. So, you know, I think we have to accept what we, what we can accept. Yeah. Can I, I think, Stefan, you were first. Uh, yes. in, in the order of all things, or summa summarum of all things, everything has its place and time. <coughs> but it is for every each individual to get to the awareness of certain things, because each one of us has There's a lot I can say in the past. Yeah, the young man next to Becky. If I'm one exception, I'm going to say hypothesis that um, you know, those could be in the intelligence. I surely didn't push to extend that hypothesis to include the fact that um, such an advanced intelligence, such an advanced spacecraft, could easily um, find a way of um, getting around the world of other domains without coming to the radar system. Oh, yes, it's. it's I don't think. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's, com you know, it's by any means complete. I'm saying there just isn't the evidence to support the physical existence of UFOs in, in terms of a bit or someone bumping into one in their car or something. Yeah, in fact, there's no radar, radar, or little radar evidence to come into it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, that yeah. you, you've got Robinson Crusoe's footprints and you never find him on the island. Put it that way. Gentleman behind Hillary, yes? Yes? I, I, th I think this is something that relates to, funny enough, we're talking about sighting the visions of the Virgin Mary. I mustn't say sightings, it sounds well, dreadful. But you see, you, p p people are all the time seeing, seeing the Virgin Mary in completely different aspects. Um, some places she's a child, some places she's a, a full grown woman, some places she's dressed in blue, some in green. Uh, either you've got to say that it's a spiritual figure and it's, it's a vision, or else you've got a Virgin Mary with a vast wardrobe of clothing. Yeah. I must take. The last two questions now, because our speaker has to get away dead on the dot at 10 o'clock. It doesn't general. get home till after two, and I'm not wearing hats. I'm just going to say that on this radar effect, we have the, shall we say, technology down to a point where we can uh, see the point is, a paint has been developed by the Japanese, which absorbs radiation on microwave ovens. The same thing, if they're allowed to use it, will be a able to be used on aircraft to avoid radio detection. In the 
Jack is Anything you want to say on that, Kevin? Uh, no. no, 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 no. But I think the, the, the crux of the whole pro the youth problem, I think, is the, uh, just those uh, physical traces. I'm, I'm mind you of the Socorro landing, where they, where they, uh, which is very similar to the one in Scotland. Yeah. And uh, of course, if we didn't have those, of course, one could say, well, uh, people say this, that, the other, hallucination. If it uh, wasn't for these, then, then, then the subject would just die. Yes. But of course, but the, the difficulties arise uh, when, when, when you've got uh, collective recipients, uh, because uh, collective hallucinations uh, are not something which is, uh, uh, is really known by scientists. Uh, and, the, and the physical traces are, of course, be devil the only thing you further. That's right. The last question. Yes, sir. Uh, this week in the House of Lords, in reply to Lord Lancashire, the local law of the Ministry of Defence stated, there is no cover-up. The only interest for MOD is in the integrity of our air defences. And over the last 18 months, they have received 2,000 reports of UFOs. Have you any information on this? And our investigators themselves now um, make the approach to investigate. Well, I, I, if, that, if a word of that is true, that there have been 2,000 reports in 18 months in this country, then all the ufologists must have been asleep. Because it's been the dullest time there's ever been. Four years. It's over a period of four years, is it? Um, yeah. I, well, I, 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 personally, I find it totally unbelievable. This was in the or somewhere around the Right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've preempted me. I'm very happy about that. Uh, Kevin's come a long way. I think he's uh, given us a lot to think about. And uh, Kevin, on behalf of uh, all the members and the guests here tonight, I uh, thank you very much for coming along and talking to us. And I'll ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're again, just show your appreciation in the usual way. Ladies and gentlemen, you know our next meeting. The date has already been given you on the 3rd of April. We look forward to seeing you then. I hope you will allow us to rush away now as I have to get our friend to the station. Thank you very Thank you. much. Right.